sort of morning. So as you can see, I am now a prisoner of the cable, which is, uh, I, I will try to deal with that. So first of all, this presentation is not really a presentation. It's, I hope that we can get some level of interactivity that we can discuss stuff because I want to provoke a few thoughts about how social architecture works, what it is, how I, I got to this, what it means for open source and beyond and all that kind of stuff. And because that is um, more or less a, a very personal topic, um, if you want to take pictures of me with a hat, you have to do it now because I'm going to take it off for the presentation. I'm sorry about that. It's, uh, it's, it, it's not corporate content. So uh, you are one of the very few audience who has ever seen me without a hat. Some people think that I'm bald and that I wear <laughs> the hat too. But, but I, have, I have good Dutch jeans and you know they, this, this hair just will never stop. So um, before, before we go into the details, let me, let me tell you a little bit of a story on, on um, how this all came along. I've been in open source uh, since 1993. I started working on the Linux kernel at that time because my uh, VGA uh, chip wasn't supported by the kernel, so I wrote my first patch, which worked after three months of hard work, and then I tried to send it to Linus Torvalds, and he said, you suck at coding, and uh, <laughs> he was right. <laughs> so after that, I uh, decided to do, at that time, now we're talking about 1997, 98 roundabout. There's still some seats here. You can j just walk here in the front, it's no problem. Um, and then in, in the end of the 90s, I started working again on coding. And uh, I was still young. I needed the experience, so I coded in PHP, which is not really a programming language, but, you know. <laughs> and I wrote in an e-commerce solution. Uh, uh, I guess most of the people here don't know it anymore, but uh, 10, 15 years ago, it was the best thing ever. It was called OS Commerce. It's a PHP. Anybody here knows OS Commerce? Has heard of it? Oh, shit. <laughs> Don't hold it against me. I, 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 was, I was young, I needed the experience. It was, it was uh, so whenever you use OS Commerce and you wonder about the weirdness of how it sends emails to customers and um, how the text is calculated, that's my code. And it's still in use after more than 15 years, which, which is kind of an exception. Um, so I started developing there as a core developer. We had a community of round about, I'm not kidding, 100,000 people worldwide. So we were, uh, people were running our shop software, it was GPL licensed, open source, and we had around about 40,000 shops running with this software. So effectively we killed the business of all the e-commerce shops at that time. So companies like Intershop and et cetera, they hated us because we did everything for free. And <laughs> so after that I did uh, some backend programming work for a hosting company, nothing special. Um, and uh, then I started working on something that became very big in my life, and that was the fight against software patents, which is kind of crazy because it has nothing really to do with programming. But I got a call from one of my users in the US, and uh, he said, uh, Jan, I'm getting sued by Amazon for patent infringement using OS Commerce. And I was like, that's crazy because you know, I programmed it. Well, not only I, quite a few other people too, but we programmed it. Why are you suing a user? It doesn't make any sense. So I started to look into how do software patents work, and I saw how dangerous they are for open source because it allows companies to monopolize uh, fundamental methods and concepts and, and regardless of the implementation. So no matter if you code this stuff yourself, when it's described in the patent, you're infringing and you have to pay for it which is totally crazy and ridiculous. At that time, I'm now talking about 2002, um, at that time there was a push in the European Commission to legalize software patents because they were not really legal. It's kind of complex. I mean, that's a presentation on its own, which is a lot of fun. Um, so effectively, the, the patent law in Europe says uh, programs for computers are not patentable, period. But then there is another clause that says, but this limitation is only for programs for computers as such. And as such can mean a lot of things. So if it's a program as such, you cannot patent it. But if it's a program not as such, then suddenly you can patent it, which is absolutely bullshit crazy. So I said, this is not acceptable. So I started looking for ways to deal with this, how to save the community, how to save my people from, from this risk. And uh, we ended up uh, doing some very crazy things in Brussels. 
we were 10 people fighting against the complete political system of Europe, uh, fighting against Microsoft, Siemens, IBM, uh, whatever you want to call them. They all wanted software patents. And we were 10 people and we had 40,000 euro. And that's it, nothing more. And we managed. We, we, we won the fight 2005 in the final vote in the European Parliament. 96% of the members of the Parliament voted against the Software Patents Directive. And uh, Software Patents then effectively, they still exist, but in a slightly more harmless way. During that time, we were discussing how do you change the world with 40,000 euro fighting against big companies. One of the companies, Microsoft, later I talked to one of the managers from Microsoft who was involved in all of that, and he told me they invested 16 million euro in lobbying to fight against uh, our movement. 16 million and we had 40,000. So how do you win such a fight? And that's the moment where stuff gets interesting, and that's the moment where I met this guy. This is uh, Peter Hintjens. Peter Hintjens is definitely more crazy than I am. Um, <laughs> We did stuff, just to give you, to give you a little bit of an insight in, in what we did, we, uh, when, when in Brussels uh, the parliament does stuff and then they go for a decision, they go to Strasbourg. So every one week in every month they take the train or the bus or whatever and all their paperwork and they go from Brussels to Strasbourg, they go into the parliament, there they do their voting and etc. and then they go back to Brussels. We were on that train all the time with flyers and etc. It was illegal, of course. You know, we were not allowed on that train because it was only for members of parliament. Somehow we always made our way in and we distributed flyers. And these flyers were not against software patents. That was Peter's trick. Peter's trick said we have to show them how ridiculous this all is. So we had flyers that promote software patents in the most ridiculous way. We had flyers that said patents against poverty. If everything is patented, nobody can be poor because everybody is dead. And, uh, <laughs> and, and we, had, we had flyers, you know, uh, uh, big ideas for big business. So get rid of small companies. They only hinder big business of making more money. And US politicians should do something else. So we, we did that kind of crazy shit. And Peter explained to me um, during that time um, his experiences that he made in, in more than 30 years of working with communities, companies, building open source communities. And some of these lessons are quite the contrary to what you think you should do if you want to do social architecture, if you want to build a community. We have heard a lot today and, and, and yesterday about how to attract audiences and, and you know, how to find people and using Facebook and all that kind of stuff. And uh, that's all right, it's, it's all cool, and, and you can find your way to manipulate people to become a member of your community, that's very simple. People are highly manipulative, you can effectively manipulate everyone into everything. If you need an example for that, look at Donald Trump, I mean, yeah. or look at some other politicians we have in Europe, I'm not going to call names, but it's going to be very interesting what happens in England in the next week, when there's a vote there. Uh, be ready for a surprise, that's uh, what I can tell you. There are people in England that are now getting very close to getting rid of Theresa May and then it's going to turn into Labour. There is a big chance for a surprise. What Peter told me and taught me over the years is that to build a successful community, you, have to do a very, you have to, only have to do a very few things. And these very few things are based on the oldest concept in philosophy ever. You know, I'm uh, sorry for, for the people who are religious in this room. I am not. I'm an atheist. I don't believe in any bearded guys in the sky watching over me because it, it somehow doesn't fit. But all religions are based on one single rule. When you look really deep down to, to the philosophy of religion and the philosophy of society, there is one rule, and that's the golden rule. The golden rule in its simplest form says, do to other people what you want to see happening to yourself. That's it. Nothing more. There is a negative form of the golden rule that says don't do to other people what you don't want to see happening to yourself. This is used by religions because it allows you to create rules and punish people, which is always what centralistic organizations want. Peter told me you have to do it in a different way. What you need to do is you need to find smart people, but not too smart people. <laughs> And the reason behind that is extremely simple. There is a concept which you find in universities quite often, um, which I called uh, problem and intelligence overload. When you have 
experts, real experts on a specific topic and they sit together and they work on a problem, they tend to drift into directions that are not of interest to the general audience you want to attract. They tend to focus on very small problems that are very academic and the people outside are looking at it like, uh-huh, yeah, but how do I fix my shop? You know, what's, how can you, and then these people tend to, I'm, I'm exaggerating of course, and then these people tend to brush newcomers off and they tell them, read the code, understand the stuff, read the manual, come back when you understand what we're doing here, leave me alone when you don't know it. And this kind of, of behavior is rampant in open source communities. You know, for, sometimes it's fun. Uh, when, when you read some emails by Linus Torvalds on, on all the evil things we people at Red Hat do, um, so there's one famous email where he told us we are effectively, I'm not going to use the, the, the real words because this audience doesn't deserve that, but it effectively ended up with uh, Red Hat people regularly going to Microsoft to perform sexual favors. <laughs> Let's leave it at that. Um, so I got, in, I got into a discussion with Linus Torvalds about that and I said, Linus, you cannot do this. I mean, this is ridiculous. It has nothing to do with code. It has nothing to do uh, with the work we do. It was about encryption in the kernel and, and you know, very complicated stuff. And Linus then in private said, Jan, I understand, and it was a little bit rough, but I have an image out there, so I will not apologize in public. Now, these are the people, and this is where the weird thing starts. These are the people you do not want to have in your community. For the Linux kernel, there is no way out. We have to keep Linus Torvalds. So what we need to do is we need to brainwash him. We need to lock him up in his room in his wearing his, 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 his whatever hoodie or whatever and tell him, Linus, talk to the wall and, you know, that's okay, but in public, please don't do this. What happens in communities is why do, the, the first question we always need to look at is why do communities form? I often get asked by customers and say, we have this wonderful piece of code, we are going to make it open source, and then everybody will look at it and you know, it's going to be the biggest thing ever. This is not how it works. Open source is a world of people with, who are very opinionated, they have very strong opinions, and they only come when they see something is good for them in this. They don't come if you tell them how cool something is, they don't care about that. If they have the similar problem that they need to solve, they will come to your code and they will work with it. If they don't care about your code, no matter how good it is, nobody will come. And you see this all the time. You see companies publishing giant piles of source code, you know, throwing it over the wall, as we say. And then they, they throw it over the wall and say, now it's open source. Why aren't you people using it? Why aren't you people helping us? Why aren't you people doing work for free so we can make more money? We don't understand it. Open source sucks. And, and, and this is what Peter was, was working on for, for the longest time of his life. He unfortunately died last year. Um, so I cannot, so I can now talk freely and he won't call me afterwards and tell me that I talk bullshit. That's, that's a good thing. And uh, yeah, he's, he's, he was a crazy guy. So, so just to give you an insight in how crazy he was, um, when he was, it was last year in uh, April, um, so he, got, he had cancer and uh, the cancer came back after five years and he knew it was going to be over. So, you know, we were all preparing for it and, 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 and he said, you know, this is going to happen. He lives in Belgium. In Belgium, uh, uh, euthanasia is legal, so he could decide when he would die. And then uh, he called me in, in March and he said, Jan, do you have time in April? And I said, yeah, I have time in April, no problem. So I plan to do a weekend. Uh, I, do, I plan to do my own wake party. So the wake party is normally after someone has died. But Peter said, that's ridiculous. You know, why should all these people come to honor me when I'm not there anymore? Why don't we do it when I'm still here so that I can have my beer and we can have food? So we had a long weekend with Peter in Brussels, in his house. We had to bring the food and the drinks because he, he couldn't walk anymore and etc. But that was a positive power, a positive energy that I will never forget. And this is the way he looked at people. He always loved people. And he said, my job when I create a community is to protect my community from the assholes out there who want to destroy it. And they will come. Whatever you do, there will be assholes. Sorry for that. They're psychopathic people. And psychopathic people are not bad people. Don't get me wrong. 20% of the people on this planet have psychopathic tendencies. It's a very normal thing. Ask a psychologist about it. It doesn't mean they're full-blown psychopaths running around killing people and doing crazy shit. It, it just means that they have a very strong will, they always look for their own advantage, and they're willing to shove other people aside to gain their goals. This is what they do, and that's not a bad thing. 
These are people that you need sometimes because they push stuff forward. They make big changes. They motivate people to do stuff. You just have to keep them at bay. You need to keep them in control and you need to keep them focused on stuff or else you end up as Linus Torvalds talking about Microsoft and Red Hat. But the point is, if you want to create a community out of nothing, if you think you have a brilliant idea and you should do it as a project, no matter if it's source code or a social project, forget it. One of the things that we heard yesterday uh, from our good friend from Canada was that every idea already exists. Everything has already been done. That's nothing new. So the first thing you need to learn in building communities and doing social architecture is you are not special. You are just a part of it. You have this idea, it's not new. Somebody had it years before. Somebody had it maybe centuries before. You, you will be surprised if you go into history to see a lot of the things we do nowadays in software already existed as mechanical projects by people who were invested into this stuff. So it's nothing new and that means there are a lot of people out there who think in similar ways, who have similar ideas and they either want to help you or they see you as competition. And that is your task. You need to create a welcoming environment where people are free to contribute and this freedom to contribute goes extremely far. One of the first lessons in social architecture is you do not own your project. And I do not own my screensaver. Okay. <laughs> Um, go. Yes, it's a Linux machine, so it takes a little bit longer. <laughs> there we go. Um, so if you want to, to, to follow along or know, read more about this, um, ah, this, is, this is really tough. No, just switch to that tab. Ah, whatever. I need to do this in the more mundane way. Sorry for turning my back on you. I know that's not... Very good. So this is his website, hintjens.com, uh, which will be available for a long time. We made sure of that. And here is the collection of the stuff he worked. I just pulled out the collection about community building and social architecture. Um, and there you see he was not shy to go into controversial stuff. So we had very long discussions about uh, sexual harassment in communities. How do you create a community that is welcoming to women? Um, and the main thing, the main lesson we've learned is treat them as everyone else. You know, don't, don't make a fuzz about it. Don't make a giant discussion about it. Uh, everybody's now talking about community guidelines and, you know, anti-harassment policies and all that kind of stuff. If you have that problem in a community, it means your problem consists of assholes. Your community has bad people in them who do this shit. Get rid of them. So rule number one from, from uh, Peter is when you meet a psychopath or somebody who is not friendly to other people, kick him out. No discussion. You don't need him. And then people come back and say, yeah, but he's, he's our best developer. He's the smartest developer. He writes the best code. Kick him out. You don't need him. He is poison to your community. He goes onto mailing list and because he is a very good programmer, he can argue with everyone, make them look bad, make them look small, and he will use that to gain more power in your community. That's why they are these kind of people. Kick him out. As I said at the very beginning, you don't need smart people in your community. You need good people. You need people that want to communicate. You need people that are open for discussions, that are willing to make complete drastic changes to the project when the need is there, and that are also going to give up. One of the good things about online communities is it's a throwaway world. So what Peter did, he created more than, than 200 communities. And most of them were tests. He was just like, hey, I have an idea how to do uh, in my next community how to do stuff better. So let's create a community. Let's find whatever goal and then see if people come and see how it behaves. And if it doesn't work, kill the community, start the next one, throw it away. You, people don't really invest into communities. People go into communities because they think there is something good for them in here. It's always a very personal motivation. You have very few people that are very altruistic and really want to change the world and they will spend their whole life. Richard Stallman, for example, is such a person. Everybody here knows Richard Stallman or has heard the name? Yeah. yeah. He was in Armenia six years ago. Six years ago. Yeah. <laughs> what? Was was a good presentation? Was it fun? It was fun, yeah. But it was special, huh? You know, he... He was a few times in the Yeah. I was 
So I'm, I'm in a, I'm in a love-hate relationship with Richard since years, um, because uh, I think, you know, he has to be a fundamentalist in what he does. That's his image that he created for himself, and that stops him from being a good person. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and and don't mean it in a negative way. I really admire Richard, and 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 when we meet, we have very good discussions and etc. And we meet quite often at conferences or whatever. Last time was in Brussels. Um, and I was walking there, and I'm an open source guy, but I have an iPad. For a very simple reason, I want to watch movies when I'm on an airplane. So I have this iPad. So I'm walking with this iPad in my hand, with uh, Google Maps open to get to my hotel. And uh, Richard sees me from across the street, totally by accident. And Richard looks at me and says, oh. <laughs> That's an iPad. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yeah, Richard, whatever. Let's get to that discussion. When I did OS Commerce, it, you know, it was OS Open Source E-Commerce Solution, OS Commerce. And Richard wanted to use it for the shop of the Free Software Foundation. And Richard said, you have to rename it to FS Commerce because I don't like the term open source. It has to be free software. And I said, yeah, but pfft, commerce, this sounds really, you know, <laughs> it's not going to happen. So that's why they created their own shop solution that never really worked. Um, so back, back to the point. Um, when you, first of all, all of you here in this room should not be afraid to create communities. You do this all the time in your private life. You don't even notice. Every time you want to organize something, a party or, or uh, whatever small event, or you go to a party, then you're already part of a community. A community has a very scientific discussion. There is a whole uh, scientific uh, branch that looks at this stuff. and. Uh, these, these are called uh, communities of interest. So where people with the same interest meet to work together on something. That's the fundamental definition of every kind of community. And when you create a community, you have the first lesson you have to learn is you are going to not be in charge very soon because there are always people better than you out there that can do things in a better way. And you have to accept that, that you are not the smartest person on this planet. Wisdom comes from the crowd. Everybody knows this. It's a very long history. It, it goes back to Machiavelli and uh, Vox Populi, Vox Dei, and etc. All of these, these, these old things. And it doesn't mean that the crowd always is, is, is a genius in finding solutions. Not at all. But the crowd, the crowd wisdom, generates the equal, the level playing field for people to participate in. If you have a community only of total super duper experts, they're up here and the users are down here then you have to have a lot of translations layer to keep them together and you lose a lot of communication in these layers. So it's better to have the users and the developers more or less on the same level if possible so that it goes faster. One of the things that I have always done in communities is I took at least 10 hours a week, at least 10 hours a week, typically two hours per working day, to answer <coughs> beginner questions in the forums. Even if it was the same question over and over again, I never used copy-paste replies to that. I always wrote every single reply myself. The reason for that is I, I can tell people to look up the FAQ. I can tell them to read the documentation. But what you are doing with that, and that's the second big point of the theory, you are taking motivation away from people. People ask a question because they are interested in getting an answer. And even if they're totally stupid people, and they ask a question that is answered on the start page of your project, directly there, the first big headline answers the question. Still, you have to see this person asking as somebody who is willing to invest in your project, who asks a question and he doesn't know better, so treat him like a good friend and slowly but surely guide him to understanding. What you create with that is people that will stay in your community. So take your time for that. It's, it's boring sometimes. Well, for me, it's not boring because I spend a lot of time in hotels having nothing to do and I could go at the bar and get drunk. But, you know, why not help people? So this second lesson of opening and being opening and welcome includes all of this. You have to always be the friendly person. You have to take people serious because as a founder of a project, you are the shining example for the culture you want to see in your project. When you do it the right way, nobody, and somebody else does something wrong, and you tell them it's wrong, they can always see that you are doing it the right way. And this is a very positive reinforcement of the culture you want to see. And when you see someone who behaves badly, who misbehaves in the community, 
you also have all the reasons to kick him or her out. Because you can say, by example, this is how we work, this is how we communicate with our people, and then they say, yeah, but that's boring, I'm a developer, I know my stuff. These people ask stupid questions. Okay, forward the question to me, I will take care of that. Yeah, but you've got another, a lot of other things to do. Again, forward it to me, this is the culture, I will deal with it, I will find a solution for that. If this problem is too big for you and if you don't want to deal with it, but for the rest you're doing a good job inside the community, no problem, we share everything, the responsibility, the work and the fun. And that, that kind of opening and welcoming culture is really hard work. It's really tough, sometimes you sit there, so I have this rule, I don't post after one beer. Because I know after I have drunk one beer, my synapses are already freeing up themselves and I would post passive aggressive replies. So I then find someone else in the community says, can you take care of this question? I know it's a very simple question, but I would set the wrong example if I answer it right now. Typically it ends up with me being so frustrated that I drink 10 beer and then I go to bed and the next morning everything is solved. That's that's another big lesson. A good community solves problems themselves in their own way and you don't have to care about it. If you have good people working together, they will take care of almost everything. And this is where stuff gets really crazy. This sometimes means that they move the community in a complete different direction from what you want. And now the big question arises, what are you going to do about that? Are you going to tell these people to not do that and come back to the original goals of the project? Or are you telling them, okay, let's see where this leads. You can guess my answer, of course. You have to do this. If your community decides to move in a different direction, that's their decision. You are there to support them, even if it's the wrong direction. Let them drive themselves against the wall. You lose nothing, it's just a community, it's just an open source project. There is no uh, venture capital involved, there is no money involved. If you set it up the right way, if you try to do it as a venture company, you're a startup company and you want to create a community for your people, um, you know, th that's a different story. But if you talk about pure open source uh, communities, if you don't like where they're going, leave. The same you ask from the other people, just walk out because they will, come, they will do it on their own, it's good. And if you want to have your original goal, create the next community, don't worry. You know, create a fork, start all over again, and then after a year you will come together, there will be a big unification party, and then everything starts all over again. And this cycle runs continuously, because the biggest lesson in software communities is software is completely worthless. Code is completely irrelevant. Now, to all the developers here who write fantastic code, sorry for that, but this is the reality. The reality is that in a good working open source project, all software code gets rewritten and refactored typically every three years. That's normal. After three years, other developers pop up with different priorities and they rewrite code and they refactor code. So your code ultimately is totally worthless. Take that into account when you form a community because you must focus on the people and not the code. You must create that welcoming atmosphere. That's your job as a project leader, as a community founder. You have to have this welcoming atmosphere. Without that, everything is becoming irrelevant anyway. Look at the lists on, on GitHub and etc. This is one of So, okay, when I look at a new software project, for example, as I told yesterday, I do home automation, which most of the time works, and I'm really proud of it. But sometimes it fails spectacularly, it's, uh, and it's fun. So I'm always on the look for little projects. So for example, I have at home, I have uh, the Philips uh, U lighting system, you know, these Philips U lamps that you can <coughs> change in color, you can move them in all colors and, and brightness and etc. It's totally crazy. And uh, I even have a little piece of software uh, that is connected to my stereo, so I have my own U disco at home, which is totally cool. Well, yeah, most of the time. And uh, so I was, I was, I had made the fundamental decision for my home automation that I want to use a specific protocol to control everything, which is MQTT. MQTT is a very simple protocol, and it's ideal for home automation, and it's very simple. But the Philips U lamps don't talk MQTT. They have their own whatever Zigbee Lightling protocol. So I was thinking, how do I glue this together? Again, back to one of the first things I said, all problems have been solved by other people anyway. There was an open source project out there, a guy who wrote a, a, a connection glue code uh, in Java, 
uh, U to MQTT, bidirectional, and it works. So I installed it, and I saw it was working, so it was good. So I gave it a star at GitHub, and uh, then I bought the new motion sensor, and it didn't work anymore. So it crashed completely because this motion sensor sends messages that this glue code couldn't understand. So it's open source, so I started looking into it. So I was checking it, and I'm, you know, I'm, not, a, I'm not a good developer. And uh, specifically when we talk about Java, I'm definitely not a good developer. So I had a hard time going through all the regexes and the parsing that was happening there and generating the right messages. But eventually I got it to work in, 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 you know, in, in a very patchy way, but it worked. I could control my lights again and the motion sensor worked. So I was totally happy and proud of this and etc. So I made a, a pull request and uh, sent this guy, this German guy, I sent him the pull request and I said, here, uh, you know, uh, I know it's not good code, but it's working code. Maybe you can do something with it. Maybe you think it's good enough anyway. So go for it. I got a reply six weeks later. Six weeks later, this guy told me, you are using spaces instead of tabs in your code. <laughs> And, and I, was, I was, wait a second, what about the code? I mean, it, this is trivial stuff. You know, of course, if you want to have, you don't have it in your coding guidelines. I checked it. No, I don't have coding guidelines because everybody knows you have to use uh, spaces and not tabs. No, it's, I can show you to the religious war that is going on since the 1940s about spaces or tabs and etc. and how big a tab should be. Let's not go there. I know that part. But honestly, what about the code? So I reformatted everything from tabs to spaces, search and replace is your friend, committed it back again, made a pull request, waited another eight weeks, <laughs> and after eight weeks he came back and he said, um, yeah, your code works, but I have a better idea for it. And that was three months ago. Nothing has happened. So this is how you not run an open source project. I was motivated. I wanted to add my help, no matter how bad I am at coding. But I wanted to show this guy, your code is appreciated. I'm using it on a daily basis at home. And I want to help to make it better. And the only thing he had to tell to me is tabs and spaces. Leave me alone, because I know how to do this stuff. This is something very typical in open source projects. Unfortunately, I've seen this happening all the time. Now, I'm totally crazy. I don't give up. You know, I'm still working on this. So I've actually forked it now. And I'm planning to publish that fork on GitHub. And then this guy will come to me and say, why are you forking my code? You're a bad coder anyway. And then you know, I'm sitting and I'm saying, you're just a fucking asshole. Sorry for that. I don't give a shit about what you do. But you are not listening to what I say. You're not reacting to my pull requests. I try to do it in a very friendly way. You told me absolute irrelevant feedback, tabs and spaces. That's totally irrelevant and has nothing to do. You demotivated me completely. You made me look like an idiot, which I am. That's perfectly fine. But there are nicer ways to say it. So don't do this. And that's where, where Peter has, has said a long time ago, um, don't do that. Do it completely the opposite way. So in his projects, and his projects are huge. Uh, so do people here, some of the people here know AMQP, the Advanced Message Queuing Protocol? Do people know 0MQ? 0MQ? 0MQ is Peter. He was, he was the guy who founded the community and who set the rules. And if you know 0MQ, um, you know, so 0MQ is a messaging queuing system and, and you're very lightweight, very fast, and extremely good code, and, and lots of connectors, 600 different connectors, language connectors, and et cetera. And the way it is done is, is extremely simple. He said, so how does, how does normal, how does old-fashioned open source work? You have a project leader, and he is typically a guy. And the project leader has a few people who care about the subsystems, and he selects them personally because they are people he trusts. And then you have a whole bunch of, of, of regular contributors, and then you have a bunch of people who don't regularly contribute, but they're in the community. And typically, that's how the hierarchy works, from the project leader to his servants to the regular contrips down to the people they don't know. Peter said, do it exactly the other way around. The majority of patches you will get for an open source project are flyby contributors. People who see one single thing, a little problem, and they say, OK, let's solve this, send a pull request, and then they're out. They will not join your community. They will be gone after a day. What they want to see is that they get rewarded for it, positive feedback. So Peter's uh, uh, projects all work the same. Every pull request gets merged immediately, period. 
If it breaks everything, which happens, then, it's, then the other, the regular contributors will come in and they will fix it and they will tell this guy, who, or typically it's a guy, uh, who, who wrote the, the bad code, they will tell him, you know, don't do this anymore and etc. Two advantages. First of all, this person who does the commit gets immediate positive feedback. It only takes minutes and his, his, merge, his, his pull request is merged. So he writes his stuff, he's unsure about this community, he doesn't know how it works, and the first feedback he gets is, thank you, it's merged. So he's like, whoa, you know, whoa, they like me. Positive feedback. Now you can discuss with it. And when everything breaks, one of the regulars will, typically it's, you know, it's a very simple mistake these people make. So you fix it, you put in another pull request, and then it gets into the trunk, and then the stuff starts working again. And this regular writes in his, uh, in his uh, log message, he writes fixed problem X acts with that because of this and that and that in a very friendly, professional way. So you offer this person positive feedback on a second level where he can, or if he doesn't want to, he can ignore it, but he can learn what he did wrong and how it was fixed by somebody who knows his stuff. Again, it's a full positive feedback cycle. So inside these communities like ZeroMQ, um, there are, not everybody is allowed to commit immediately. You know, so it, it, there is this, because you want to make sure uh, that there is a certain level and, and you know the people. Uh, but the people with commit rights, they are in a continuous battle on who merges faster. So. They, when, when they meet at a, at a conference or whatever, they typically, the guy who committed the fastest doesn't have to pay for the beer. Everybody who merges gets free beer. And, and this, again, this creates a very positive feedback cycle in your community, and that is what you want on every single level. So Peter says, when, when, when we started doing this, the regulars, they were very upset about this. They said, this is, this is not going to work. It's going to break every single day, and you know, our whole project is going to, to go away. And, and Peter said to them, it's very simple. I'm going to do it anyway. And if you don't like it, feel free to leave. You know, if, if you don't like this direction, then you know, we don't belong together. I've talked to a lot of the people in the project. They agree it's worth trying. You are one of the 10% who, uh, who disagrees with that. Oops. Who disagrees with that. So either you fit into the 90% of the people we have, or you go away because we don't need you. Please make your decision. Typically, they then come around and, and they start working. What has happened since then is pure magic. If you look at the way ZeroMQ is built nowadays, how they have an extremely stable code base with more than 600 different language and, and system connectors that are maintained all the time. Patches and, and, and pull requests come in on, on, a, on a minute basis in, in some projects. And it still keeps on working because this is the way you should do it. He wrote a book about that called Social Architecture. It's a very thin book. It's, it's just this. Um, and it's, of course, Creative Commons license. You can download it for free from his website. Um, please, I advise all of you, read that book, take it with you, read through it, and, and see what he has to say. You will, you will meet someone um, who has often been described by a lot of other people as an extremely arrogant asshole, which he is, or was. Um, but he was it for all the good reasons. He knew that he had to push people in a certain direction for them to become better because they were stuck in things that went wrong. Another lesson learned from there, and now we come to the part that is not as fancy and as positive. People working in open source projects invest a lot of their time and a lot of their brains and a lot of their thinking. And you can only do this for a defined amount of time and after that you break apart. It's a natural law. You cannot stop this from happening. People burn out typically after three to four years of hard work on a project. It's normal. So you also have to create a system to get these people back on track. What Peter did is, he saw, when he saw the science, when he saw people doing weird things, and he was very good at that, then what he said is, he, he called these people and he said, hey, and that's the connection between commercial and open source communities. He always had a company backing everything. He said to this person, hey, you know what? Um, I see you're struggling. I, if I ask you, you will not admit it. You will tell me that I'm wrong and it's just temporary and will go away and etc. But I know it and here is my advice and here is my offer. You come to Brussels for three months. You live in my place. 
you do whatever you want. You get money, you get paid, you have, a, you have your own room, you get your desk if you want to, if you don't want to, it's also okay. If you want to walk through Brussels for three months, I don't care, but you are safe. We, can, we, will take, we, we took your work for three and a half years, your hard work, and now something is going wrong. So now we will also take care of you. Don't forget that part. You always talk about people, and people have problems. That's normal. Only focusing on the good things, on the fun at conferences, on the flows of beer and food and etc. Yes, it's fun. I've been in this circus now for almost 30 years. I know how good it is when you go to Fossil in Brussels and etc. But sometimes you see people where you know they're on the edge. They will fall down. Don't let them. Take them by the hand. Lead them back to, to the real world, even if it costs money and time, because they gave so much to your community, you owe them. It's simple, it's a golden rule. Do to other people what you want to see happening to yourself. When I feel bad, I hope somebody else will help me, so I will do this very naturally for everyone on this planet. It's tough sometimes, and uh, it sometimes is weird. I, I, I was at, at, at Peter's place when he had two of these people. One of them was, was really in a very deep depression, was crying all the time, and, and uh, it, it was really bad. So we, we had organized some medical help and, and other things. And he came back after two months, and he is now one of the most important project leaders in the ZeroMQ community. He doesn't like to talk about that. I will not tell you his name. Um, but um, he is now unbelievably productive. He has gone across his limits. He has seen the deep fall that comes there. But he has been picked up and he has been put back into place. And now he knows how far he can go. And now he knows exactly what he can do or what he cannot do. And he's one of the most productive members ever. Don't write people off. That's the big lesson here. You know, you're in this together, so you should work together. Um, I don't know what else did I put up here. The FAQ, for example, this is, <laughs> yeah. Um, if, if you read this, this first one, I'm, I'm going to read it out loud, which I normally don't do, but um, how can we grow software communities with more female developers is? The short answer is remove barriers to entry and opportunities for selection bias. The longer answer is, Contributors self-select from the existing pool of users and potential users, and you cannot distort this process without harming the community. This is where I get into very aggressive discussions with uh, uh, community managers. Everybody, who here is community manager? No community, there is one. All right, so community managers at tech conferences, when you go to Fossilman, etc., they don't care about community. They care about stuff like that. We need to have an anti-harassment policy. No, we need to write code. Sorry, this is an open source community. We write code. Yes, but your people could misbehave. There must be rules in place. When people misbehave, we kick them out. Simple. That's our rule. That's not enough. You have to write 20 pages of what happens if and if somebody says an evil word, what do you deal with it? And you need to have a person dealing with that. I said a community manager like you, who doesn't code himself or herself? No, sorry, not interested. And then they get into a real fight with me because I'm ignorant, I'm arrogant, and I'm, I'm old school. And then I show them the numbers of the communities I participate in, and for ex specifically the numbers at Red Hat, where we have now round about 20% uh, female developers working at Red Hat. 20%. That's not enough. Fully agree, it should be 50%. But 20% is far better than the rest of the industry. And we have no problems with that inside Red Hat because we focus on the code and we hire people that are smart enough, fair enough, and open enough. When we have a rotten apple in, a, in our basket at Red Hat, we make sure they find another job. They have to leave the company. Very simple, in a friendly way. We will actually help them find a job where they fit in, which might be something completely different, but we need to weed these people out. So we don't call them community managers at Red Hat. We call them community gardener. Yeah, because they have to pluck out the bad weed from the good weed. That's their job. This has helped us tremendously to, to be an attractive company for female developers. Because they say this is, the, this is one of the very few companies where it really doesn't matter if you're a man or a woman. And honestly, and, and you're, you're allowed to laugh about this, absolutely. Uh, sometimes I get emails on, on one of the internal mailing lists at Red Hat. Uh, of a male developer who announces that all of his operations are done and he is now a female and he wants to be addressed with a female name. This happened at least five times in the years I was at Red Hat. I've not seen it the other way around, but even if that happens, we don't care. 
because we focus on something else, and that's the bigger thing. That's, that's open source, that's what we do at Red Hat, that's the mission we have. So wrapping it all up, and, and you know, I, I cannot and I didn't plan to give you answers to how to do stuff. I can only give you hints and I can give you deeper information that you can read and that you can learn something from or not. I, I don't care. Honestly, I really don't care because it's your work, your community and not mine. I will always offer help. If you, if you have any problems, send me an email and you will get some very crazy replies and you will look at it in the first moment and say, I can never do this. But if you try, you will see it, it, how it works. This is how we did the software patent things. We actually manipulated a vote in the European Parliament because why not? physically manipulated the voting. It was a criminal offense. You know, we touched the heart of democracy, but it worked. It made, it made the people in Brussels discuss things. And that's sometimes you have to go extremely far to kick your community back into the right direction. And you shouldn't be afraid of that. The maximum you can lose is your position in the community, and then you start a new one. Who gives? Doesn't really matter. We are just people trying to work together. And we've, if you want to create such a welcoming atmosphere, read, read his books, you know, there, it's, everything is for free. So here, for example, how do you deal with rude contributors who are brilliant and highly skilled? The short answer is kick them out. That's it. That's the whole philosophy that we have because the longer answer is give them enough rope to hang themselves and then kick them out. <laughs> and the full, answer is, the full answer is if you keep these people around, they are poison to other people and they will make your community become a very bad one and this is what you don't want. No matter how skilled these people are, no matter how good they are at coding, and some of them are geniuses. But this is also a lesson we have learned at Red Hat a long, long time ago. Uh, so uh, it's similarly based. Of course, Red Hat would never use this kind of language because we're an American company and everything is nice and cool and etc. But um, when I started at Red Hat a long time ago, we had, we had similar discussions about this because Red Hat does not build products. We take upstream code from a lot of communities, bundle them into an offering, and then sell that as a subscription to customers. So Red Hat Enterprise Linux, for example, is 7,000 different open source projects in, in this distribution, 7,000. That means 7,000 upstream communities out there. At that time when I was working at Red Hat, so we're now talking about 10, 10 years ago roundabout, we were uh, somewhere between 1,500 and 2,000 people in total at Red Hat. So you can imagine in a lot of these communities, we didn't participate at all. We just took their code and bundled it. That was it. And then we started looking at the stuff that is really important to us, the stuff that we need to maintain, the stuff that we need to give long-term sustainability and warranty to our customers for. And then we decided maybe it's good to hire these developers and pay them directly. So again, think about it this way. We have something in our distribution. Let's take, I don't know, uh, take whatever library, uh, take or take Java or no, let's take Samba, for example. Samba, the, the whatever Windows file services stuff that always breaks. Um, so Samba. You have something like 20 developers out there. There's a company behind Samba, a German company. They hire some of these developers, but not all of them. And we see that two or three of these developers do really good work. Um, so we go to them, and this is how we work. This is how we really work. We go to them and we say, how about you continue to do your work on Samba 90% of your time, 90% of your time is fully Samba community upstream, and there is 10% of your time that we need you to backport the features to our supported versions and etc. But 90% is upstream work. So you're going to continue to do what you love to do, but you're going to get fully paid for it. How about that? I mean, this is an offer nobody refuses, which is a good thing. And this is how we hire developers. And we look at these developers not at the best coders. We are not interested in the best coders. We've learned that lesson together with Peter a long time ago. The best coders tend to be poisonous, aggressive, uh, psychopathic, uh, extremely hard to manage and get them to a conference and they start yelling around because nothing works. And it's, it's, it's these kind of people. You have to have that trait for that genius coding skill. We don't want them. We are looking for the developers who are accepted members of the community who can help us push features forward, who can help us move the project forward, and who can also translate the, the upstream community needs with the commercial needs our customers have. These are the people we're looking for. So we're always looking for the friendly people. 
And finding friendly people is really not that complicated. It typically only takes one conference and, and, and you know, for me, one beer, and then I can tell you exactly how this person is. I've also met people who are extremely bipolar even on this. People who are, and this is actually a standard, who are extremely rude and aggressive online, really rude and aggressive. They write stuff that you would be ashamed of. And when you meet them in person, they're the shyest people you've ever seen. They almost don't dare to sit on the stage because they're afraid of people. Uh, somehow I have the feeling that they don't know how to channel their positive energy and then they turn it into hatred and aggressiveness online. When you're on Facebook, on Twitter, you know this stuff, especially when you are female and you post something there and you always get these weird idiots posting stupid replies about you, know, you being a woman and, and something about that. And, and I always ask myself, why are these people doing it? I know a few of these people. I've met them at conferences. And at conferences, they don't even dare to look at a woman. You know, they're just so, so like this and etc. And I'm, I, I cannot understand this. These are the kind of people you do not want in your community. When they're honest, they're real people, and real people move things forward. So wrapping it all together, everything that I try to, to tell you, go forth and build communities. Get out of this room and start building communities. It's simple. And if you fail, build the next one. Don't be ashamed of it. Go out there and do stuff. And don't do it on Facebook. I mean, honestly. <laughs> Facebook is the worst way to do it. Do it with code, with GitHub, and etc. Second thing, start looking for nice people and try to get nice people into your community even if they are not the best developers or have the most knowledge and etc. People that are nice to other people will pull more people into your community. You will get the good people in there. But if you focus on the geniuses, on the special people that know they are geniuses, that know they can demand almost everything, then you're going in the wrong direction. But again, Try it, you know, see how this fails, learn from failure. The best thing that the internet has allowed us to do <coughs> is to fail often, learn fast and start all over again without uh, anything else. It's the end of my time anyway, because, um, okay, now I hope I brainwashed all of you <laughs> with a lot of weird thoughts. Go to hintians.com, download the books. They are completely creative comments. If you have enough money, buy them. Uh, because it, it's, it's uh, self-published uh, and etc. If you buy his books, the money goes uh, to his children. He had three children and uh, they live in Brussels. They, they're okay, they're fine. But every, every book that gets sold puts a little bit of money in, in that pocket. So if you can afford that, please do that. Um, and remember, uh, when, when, whenever you read something about Peter, uh, remember how he changed my life completely and hopefully he can do the same to you. And uh, with that, thank you all for listening and being here with such a great number. <laughs> Pleasure.